indicate your name. Perfect. So to, to indicate your name and your organization's name, uh, raise your hand if you want to ask the floor. And if you have any question, please uh, write that in the, on the chat. We'll keep it monitored. So we'll come back to, to them later on. Uh, keep your mic off when you don't speak. And um, we wish you an interesting webinar and a fruitful exchange of experiences. And uh, to start, a few words on what the Covenant of Mayor is. So it is the world's largest movement for local climate and energy action. So it brings together thousands of local governments who voluntarily are committed uh, to the implementation of the EU climate and energy objectives. And supporting the Covenant community achieving this objective is crucial and one of the focal points of our work. So this is why we are organizing some webinars on a regular basis uh, to discuss different topics and to provide you with inspiring and uh, concrete examples on ways to move forward. Upon signing the Covenant of Maya's initiative, um, European municipalities commit to tackle energy poverty as one key action to ensure a just transition. And that is why the Covenant of Mayors uh, Europe launched on the 11th of May its energy poverty pillar. The Co Covenant of Mayors Office Europe, in collaboration with the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, provides guidance to signatories on how they can alleviate energy poverty at the local level and help them reach their energy poverty goals. So please make sure to check the, the links we will put in the chat. Uh, moreover, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, in, in order to support EU cities in this context of energy crisis, the Commission, Covenant of Mayors and the European Committee of the Regions launched on the 19th of May the Cities Energy Saving Sprints, a joint initiative that encourages cities to take measures that will immediately reduce their energy con con consumption. So please, uh, we encourage all of you to check the Covenant website and join this campaign that you will find also in the chat. So a brief introduction of why we have decided to organize this webinar. And uh, since the summer of 2021, the energy prices have, have been rising sharply. And with the beginning of the, Russian, of the Russian war against Ukraine, they have increased even more. So today there is a serious risk that energy poverty will rise to unprecedented levels. Uh, so according to the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, between 30 and 60 million Europeans are experiencing energy poverty to various degree, uh, with the most vulnerable demographic groups being the most affected. Uh, how we can define the energy poverty? So even if there is not a shared definition at the EU level, energy poverty can be defined as a situation when energy bill, bills represent a high percentage of consumers' income and consequently it affects their capacity to cover other expenses. So those consumers who are forced uh, to reduce the energy consumption of their households with consequences on their physical and mental health and well-being, uh, they are considered to be in, in to be in a situation of energy poverty too. So energy poverty means um, that households are unable to access enough energy to ensure dignified living conditions and at an affordable price. And the direct and indirect drivers and causes uh, are multiple. And the three main factors uh, are poor insulation of buildings, high energy bills, and low incomes. So what is crucial to understand is that within these drivers and causes, there are significant gender gaps, uh, underlying the fact that women uh, are at greater risk of suffering of experiencing energy poverty compared to men. So energy poverty is not a gender neutral phenomenon and it's more common among women than among men and especially among single and older women. So it reveals to be a factor of material and social insecurity which significantly determines the women's living conditions. Uh, unfortunately, at this day, at the current stage, there is a clear lack of data to consider energy poverty with a gender perspective, a gender lens, and the current surveys and analysis methods are gender blind. So even if a few studies have been, um, have been made on this subject, there is a need of a stronger commitment and a stronger action on this, on this issue. And currently, there is a little awareness of the importance of having a gender uh, sensitive analysis uh, of energy poverty or energy policy uh, in general. Uh, but we know that without data, we cannot have visibility and with no visibility, no interest on the topic, no action and not accountability. 
Therefore, it is primordial to address all climate issues with a gender perspective. This is why we are very, very happy to welcome uh, our speakers of today's webinar. Firstly, we are welcoming Mrs. Kata Tuto, uh, Deputy Mayor of Budapest, Chair of the Envy Commission of the European Committee of the Region and Ambassador of the Covenant of Mayors. She was a reporter on the Corps' opinion on gender equality and climate change. She will help us to set up the scene today and explain why it is so important to adopt a gender perspective when addressing energy poverty issues. Unfortunately, we just learned this morning that Emil Broberg, our second speaker, couldn't make it today. Therefore, we are welcoming Jamie Just, Advisor on Equality and Diversity at the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. She will notably speak about the link between gender equality and energy, and about the EU, and she's going to present briefly the European Charter for Equality of Women and Men in Local Life. Then we'll discuss about some practical examples aimed at sharing good practices and inspire other municipalities. In this regard, we will deal with the Empowerment Project. In a few words, Empowerment is a European project present in seven countries with nine leading partners. Its objective is to tackle energy poverty and to help improve health of people in the coastal area of Mediterranean countries with a particular focus on women. Therefore, we'll give the floor to Mrs. Monica Guiteras Blaya, an energy campaigner at the Catalan Association of Engineering Without Borders, which takes part to the Empowerment Project. And finally, we will welcome Ms. Katarina Abbas Brunner, board member at Women Engaged for a Common Future, project partner with the Empowerment Project. We then hope to learn today good practices from this project and on how to empower women to take action on energy poverty and how to collect gender disaggregated data at a local level. But firstly, we'll give the floor to Ms. Katatuzu. Thank you again for being here and for participants. Don't hesitate to already ask questions in the chat. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I'll just briefly introduce myself, like what I'm doing. I'm, first of all, Deputy Mayor of Budapest, responsible for energy, transport, waste, water, make the city moving, and also, of course, for all the European projects, for all to reaching our climate goals in mitigation and in ad adaptation. But my second hat is, as I'm here today, is being member of the European Committee of the Regions, chairing the Energy, Climate Change and uh, Environmental Commission and um, about the Committee of the Regions. So what we are doing, this is, in, this is a body in the European Union, which we call the Voice of Cities. It's not a lobbying organization. It's built up of um, locally elected mayors and representatives of regions at the local level, small towns, middle-sized cities, regions. What we do is we try to channel in the voice of the cities, of local leaders. But we don't, don't just channel in to the European Commission and the European Parliament the voices of the local leaders, but we also channel in our ambitions. We channel in our experience from implementing, especially now, I think it's really, really important. We have all a lot of ambitious goals in the Green Deal. We have a lot of climate-related goals. And of course, today, the most important issue is the energy, the repower EU, energy security goals. But when it comes to making all these goals becoming reality, it's a big chunk on the shoulder of cities, of mayors to have these old things become real. So this is, this is what we do in the Committee of the Regions. We try to build a community of uh, local leaders, try to make their ambition multiply, bring in other cities. We are actively supporting the Covenant of Mayors. I was also rapporteur of the Covenant of Mayors. Budapest is one of the founders, uh, one of the first one who joined the Covenant of Mayors. With all the stages becoming the Covenant, a global initi initiative, we see that city's ambition has a real value that should be channeled in, should be thought of uh, when we have all these ambitions and in very, very difficult times. Because what we are expecting is a lot of change from our citizens. A lot of things are changing in a very, very short time. And it's not just, it cannot happen without our citizens actively participating in it. So to bring in all the ambitions, bring in all the citizens, we need this community of, uh, of local leaders. 
So what we are talking about today, energy poverty, I won't uh, um, um, say again what has been said and probably others will be talking about. But yes, we are uh, talking about the situation of homes, having unhealthy and damp homes. We are talking about uh, low income families. We are talking about high energy prices yesterday, like extremely high energy prices that has that is felt. And we talk about that men and women are in a different situation. And when it comes to energy poverty, we see much more women, but this is a symptom. And we always have to talk about the root cause because when we see the COVID crisis, we saw that it hit women harder as the same with energy poverty. So when we look at the root causes, we see the pay gap, but we see an even bigger uh, pension gap, which is around 30% between men and women. And of course there is a care gap, a care gap and a big gap in the, in the sharing of unpaid care work. So what we have to do, of course, there has to be a lot of immediate things to be done uh, to protect our citizens, because we've been, we have a lot of numbers. We've been talking about 50, 60, 70 million people. It depends on what we, when we think about energy poverty, not just heating homes, not just cooling homes in hot summers, but we can also talk about transport and mobility poverty. So there are a lot of numbers. What we see is that with this energy crisis, with this enormous increase of uh, prices within weeks and months, we don't know exactly because all of our lo local municipalities usually know those families, those citizens who needed some sort of protection. But this new price increase or skyrocketing, a lot of new families are affected and, and we have to widen our social nets. So there has to be instant things that has to happen to protect uh, citizens. There are a lot of things member states are doing, cities are doing, uh, um, fixing prices, giving out subsidies. And of course, this is one thing, an immediate thing. But we are looking at long-term things. And what we see is when it comes to spending a lot of money, we see that all the gender equality issues are evaporating. And the European Union decided with the member states that we will be spending a lot of money on recovery, on building resiliency, on uh, the Green Deal, on Repower EU. So we will be changing a lot of things, how we consume, how we build our cities, change our transport, uh, um, many things will be changing. But if we don't have data and if we don't look at all these money spent and changing our cities, changing our societies, but not knowing how will this affect men and women, will these money, a lot of money spent and this rebuilding our environment, how will this affect men and women? Will this close the gap or will this wider the gap? We don't know. This is why we say that man, gender mainstreaming, the looking the effect of spending a lot of money on what will happen in our societies. Will this uh, take off some burden from women's shoulders? Will, will this, um, uh, close the care gap or not? Will this close the um, pay gap? Will this close the uh, pension gap? We don't know. So this is why we say that everything, the recovery and resiliency plans should have a gendered lens. The spending of the green uh, deal money should have a gendered lens. Repower EU should have this gender perspective to make sure that the cities we're building, that the future we're building will be a better future for everybody in the society. So this is why we're here today and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so as you have said, we have to go to, to the root causes uh, since energy poverty, tackling more women than men is just a symptom and we should make sure that you know, in all the investments and in the long-term perspective, gender equality is taken into consideration, as you said, for instance, with gender, gender mainstreaming. So thank you very much. And I give the floor to Jamie Just, 
so the advisor on equality and diversity at CMR. And um, so Jamie, I'll leave you the I'll leave you the floor for bringing the contribution from Emil Broberg. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bea. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Tuto, uh, for raising up the really important points and sharing your perspective also uh, from your work in the Committee of the Regions. So our gender equality spokesperson, Mr. Emil Broberg, uh, sends his apologies for missing today's webinar. He was really disappointed to not be able to join, but uh, sickness leaves us no other choice sometimes. So here I am to, uh, to, to share a little bit about um, how we work on this topic with our charter. Uh, but I wanted to also yeah, explore a little bit, uh, dig in a little bit on what Ms. Tuto raised up about keeping a household adequately warm and having uh, a reasonable level of energy and affordable services in the home. There's certainly gender differences. As was mentioned, access to resources in the first place, jobs and money. And this even starts at the level of education and gender stereotypes and what kinds of fields girls can project themselves into for careers as they grow older and uh, enter the labor market. Also energy management and consumer be behaviors in the household for which women are principally responsible. These are some of the other risks contributing to women uh, falling into energy poverty more often than men. So I won't uh, go too much with statistics, but in terms of the employment rate of women and men in the EU, there is an 11.5 percent point gap uh, since 2017. And in terms of pay, the gender gap is around 13 percent uh, from 2020, which is negatively impacting incomes and in the long term uh, pensions as well. And all over the world, women spend more time engaging in unpaid reproductive tasks such as household and care work. This leads them to spend more hours at home and experience more dependence on heating and indoor air quality. In much of the EU, did you know that women are mostly responsible for energy management in the household? And looking at Sweden, who's known for being a leader in gender equality and gender mainstreaming, women still spend more time on laundry than men. And we can also look at wider social trends um, concerning unemployment, retirement, and housing costs, uh, influencing the energy use and uh, poverty. And going beyond gender, I'd like to raise up other aspects, such as age, that we can take into consideration when studying the energy use. For example, one study found that young, compared to younger households, older households have fewer pieces of equipment and are more inclined to switch off appliances when not in use, and also, we already said that energy poverty is more common among women. It is even more so among single parents and older women. So in addition to treating these underlying causes, we must take into account the different experiences and expertise of women and men and promote their equal participation in decision making, especially in the energy sector, to ensure gender responsiveness and sensitivity of policies in these fields of renew renewable energy use and development. Uh, we do have something interesting from one of our colleagues at the Brussels office of the city of Vienna, Michaela Kauer. She's the director. In one of her articles submitted to Euractiv, she talks about the EU Energy Poverty Observatory, which is providing a wealth of data on energy poverty in the EU. However, she wrote that this observatory in 2021 still did not deliver gender disaggregated data in its publicly accessible set of indicators and calls for the, she calls for the immediate repair uh, for this evidence-based policy development. And as Bea mentioned in her introduction, no data, no visibility, no visibility, no interest, no interest, no action, no action, no accountability. I will post the link to that article in the chat to follow up. So to turn now to the local dimension and the European Charter for Equality of Women and Men in Local Life, the Charter does recognize that the places and lifestyles of women and men differ, and they may tend to differ in their use of services and confront different environmental or household problems. Regretfully, the Charter, which was developed in 2006, doesn't take into account the dimension, gender dimension of energy poverty. However, we are in a process of updating this Charter currently and looking at how we could possibly add 
the mention of energy poverty into the document to give better guidance to local and regional authorities on how they can get started uh, on addressing these challenges. One good example we can already point to is in Spain. Uh, the strategy of the municipality of Barcelona, they have a, a strategy called Against the Feminization of Poverty. And there is an entire sub-chapter dedicated to energy poverty and imp improve the conditions of households of women suffering from poverty or vulnerability. I'll be happy to share the link to this in the chat. We also have in the Basque country, the province of Gibus, Gipuzkoa, excuse me, uh, and they have an observatory of energy poverty, which provides relevant and up-to-date information about energy poverty in the province and gives instruments to fight against it, taking into account social considerations. So I think I will uh, leave it there so we have plenty of time to hear from our good practices and guests. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, for this general picture and uh, explaining to us the ex existing issues and already approaching some 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 solutions from from the local level and regional level. So, without waiting more, um, let's hear the practical approaches and action. And I will leave uh, now the floor to Mrs. Monica Guterres Blaya. Blayas, thank Blaya, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm Monica from Engineers Without Borders in Catalonia. I'm also a member of the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, which is a, move, a social movement uh, formed basically by affected families by energy poverty and a majority of women inside this movement. Um, also, I wanted to point out that today, maybe we are lacking more men on the session uh, this is not a good sign, I have to say, but anyways, thank you so much for organizing it. We have a lot to share and a lot to learn from each other, and I think we bring different perspectives. So I will explain a little bit the case of uh, the Collective Assemblies on Energy Poverty, which is an initiative of the Alliance Against Energy Poverty in uh, Barcelona and Metropolitan Area of Barcelona that we have taken um, for the wider impact of empowerment project, which is implemented in several uh, countries in Europe. And that I will also share some very interesting training materials for you on the chat. Uh, the idea of empowerment project, which Katharina will also explain, is to uh, put on the center of the energy poverty discussion aspects that we normally don't. One is gender, but another one is health, which is very important from a gender perspective. And the third one would be the summer energy poverty and energy poverty in the Mediterranean areas. So the particular um, initiative of collective assemblies uh, is a tool, no? it's a, a space where people meet, uh, people affected by energy poverty, in which uh, the individual perspective is not there anymore. We do that from a collective perspective. And I think this has helped us to include more women no? and, 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 and take out the energy poverty from something that is so private, uh, which, which is the home. No? Uh, so I think um, these collective assemblies as a tool for empowerment of all vulnerable people, but particularly for women, because it's a safe space and it's a, it's a moment where they are not linked to this um, household or, or this, uh, this home that uh, still they are the ones that are caring for it in a, in a majority. I think it has brought us many, many learnings. So I will give you some very quick data on this. Uh, in two years and a half, we have had um, more than uh, 60 collective assemblies, and we have uh, had 1,300 participants. 60 of them are women. Uh, and also something that is very interesting is that uh, like in the contrary then we might think like uh, who is the person under the contract of these energy supplies, which historically has been you know, this male breadwinner figure, uh, it's not like this anymore, at least in our collective assemblies. The bills and contracts are in a 73% under 
the woman of the household. And also we are taking data from who is talking in these collective assemblies. People talk about their case, what they are experiencing in first person. And we also like write down who is speaking every time. No? So it's also 60% of women raising their hands to say what is not only their situation, but what can they share with others that have experienced the same to help them. So it's a, a way of building collective knowledge, not only from a technical perspective, uh, which has been a, a driver for the energy sector during lots of years, no? but now trying to include other perspectives that are not technical, that are from the testimonies, that are from what happens on the household in an everyday basis, which is we do care work. No? So let's talk about this and let's talk about um, the non-affordable energy situation is making my family spend less in food and more in energy, which for us doesn't make any sense. No? So they share these kind of things in the collective space. Um, and we are very happy of the, like, the way in which they come back. No, it's not that they take part once, but they come back every two weeks and they find similar people and some of them will be different. So it's a secure space. No one is blamed, no one is criminalized for not being able to pay for their, bill, for their bills. Um, and also, like, um, as I said, no, things that are not technical, but that are experienced um, moments or situations that are very, very difficult to share uh, are also on the picture. And one very important thing is that one in every 10 people taking part in the collective assemblies talks about impacts on their health. Many of them might have impacts on their health due to energy poverty situations, but one in every 10 even need to talk about this. Uh, still, uh, they are talking about their cases and it's not mandatory to talk about their health, but it just appears on the question. No? And 73% of these people sharing impacts on their health are women. This is also very important. And it's not only impacts on health in terms of physical health, but we need to talk and include the mental health situation and question to the debate. Uh, we also have seen how intersectionality is something very important on this discussion. We need to talk about women, but as we have learned from our colleagues from WECF, women in all their diversity, and also about the intersectionality with all the access of inequality. So we need to talk about migrant women being affected by energy poverty in a disproportionate way. We need to talk about single mother families, about women with disabilities, about elderly women, as other colleagues have mentioned as well. But also I, I, I was reading like this um, uh, summary of the session of today, which is how women and women-led households who are disproportionately affected by energy poverty, that maybe we can ask ourselves, uh, how many households are not led by a woman in terms of the, the bigger share of the care work? I know we are including other kinds of households, but women-led household is what we normally find. So we need to talk about all the diversity, but also recognize where there's no diversity, which is a majority of women and many times migrant women uh, assuming the care of the community. So this is also something we have seen in our collective assemblies during these years. Um, and maybe trying to go to the deeper question of uh, this ob goal and our objective that we have, and that is not easy, which is secure, sustainable and affordable energy for all. Um, we have seen still, yes, in Europe, many families that don't have access to secure uh, means or fuels in their homes. And normally in this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, households without uh, real access to energy, then 
the access uh, is then insecure and many times has led to fire on the household. Uh, and we have had some deaths in this case, which we have to be very conscious about. So uh, the access to secure energy is also related to protecting life. And this is also gender perspective that we need to include, even if it's not women, no? And then also the perspective of having access to sustainable energy. Uh, it is still a privilege for many people to have access to clean energy. And it is still a privilege for many women because we have this income, um, this inequality no? in income distribution and in socioeconomic status, we have the gender care gap. So yeah, having uh, access to solar panels installations is still a privilege for many vulnerable people and of course also for women. And finally, uh, affordable energy, this, this goal that now seems a little bit far away uh, from reality, but that affects a lot uh, these, fa these families led by women, uh, also single mother families. Um, and then I would say, what happens when secure energy, sustainable energy and affordable energy is not possible that we have more vulnerability, we have more precariousness and who is taking care of this? Again, a majority of women. So if we don't deliver the right to energy in all these um, dimensions, it has an effect on women and people who is uh, assuming the care tasks. No? So let's give this secure, sustainable and affordable access. And let's not forget about information, participation and democracy and governance and the, the right to energy, which is the perspective we want to include to the picture, should also include not only the access, but also the process of participation in this energy sector. And that doesn't only mean who is on the directive boards of the companies and the utilities. It means including perspectives that are not only technical, but also related to lived experience and uh, that treats people not only as objectives of the policies, but as subjects, as actors of change. And this is what we have seen in women of the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, who are Mari Carmen, Vicky, Cristina, many of them that have done much more than some of the policies we have to uh, transform the energy sector. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Guiteras, for this uh, rich contribution. I will try just to retreat some of the points that you have mentioned. So the fact that these collective assemblies, they offer a place where to bring energy poverty out of the private space. So to create a secure and safe space for women to share their experiences. And as you were saying, uh, it's mainly women who feel to share uh, their experience with others and who have also in their hands energy bills, for instance. And you mentioned also the, the need to bring the health, both physical and mental, um, mental health uh, into the discussion and to consider also the issue of intersectionality. So as you said, we have to consider women with all their diversity. So migrant women, uh, single mothers, uh, mean women with disabilities or elder women. And um, they need also to tackle more rooted causes. So their role in general of women in the society, gender gaps in various, in various um, under various aspects. And as you were saying, there is a need to grant the right uh, to access to a uh, secure, sustainable and affordable energy. Uh, thank you very much for sharing all the material. And, um, and finally, you mentioned the need to bring women into the decision making processes there are in these fields, so in the fields of energy, so as women can act as actors of change. So thank you very much for your contribution. And I will give the floor to Mrs. Abbas Brunner. And maybe also we can also start, uh, I don't know if uh, in the German uh, context, how these collective assemblies, if if you have this initiative and how do they work? So 
um, I invite you to bring in the German perspective as well. Yeah, so thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Okay, yeah, so thanks for having me here. And I think it's very important that you organize um, the webinar with the focus on energy poverty and gender. And so my name is Katharina. I work for Women Engaged for Common Future, WCF. We also, we are a project partner at the Empower Me project. So we do not directly implement activities within our Empower Me project in Germany because it's focused on the Mediterranean countries. But I can um, also bring in some uh, examples from Germany, from other projects which will, uh, were implemented by Caritas, for example. I'm also in Germany a, um, a, a board member of an umbrella organization of energy communities. That's very interesting because that's already the link for, for energy policy, for example, that we for example, the Renewable Energy Directive and some, some grant programs that we also still, the gender perspective, where, for example, where we could face energy poverty. But well, I have prepared a presentation which I would like to share. I keep it short and I'm very happy also to answer your questions later on, if there are still any. And yeah, so with Monica, so we are in the in the um, Empower Meet project, and I'm sorry, so you can my, you can see my screen. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Thank okay, you. so it's very good. Let me check. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, maybe I am. It's a kind of repetition what I'm doing here because. But in the Empower Me project, for example, so we had worked out um, four dimensions of gender and energy poverty. Most of you already mentioned them, but uh, so it's very important to, to see it when talking about that 57 million people in Europe cannot keep their homes. Uh, warm during the winter and even 104 million people cannot keep their homes comfortable during the summertime and for example empower me is also a project focusing on summer energy poverty which is not yet in the focus of many um, decision makers to our understanding and when talking about energy poverty and how women and women-led households are disproportionately are affected by energy poverty we always we find four dimensions so it's of course um, the economic uh, situation so the gender pay gap what has been already mentioned that, which leads to a very high gender pension gap which leads that um, uh, women women-led households, they do have less time for paid work, for example. That's one crucial point. A second point, of course, is a physiological point, so that women are more heat and cold sensitive. Uh, women are more sensitive to extreme temperatures, where we also we have some data, for example, for tropical nights. And also, um, older women older women are more likely to be poor when they are when they live alone. So that's a physiological dimension to check. Monica already mentioned the health situation because it's of course living in inadequately uh, insulated homes, for example, could uh, could um, come to um, to physiologic physiological impact. So like uh, cardiovascular or respira respiratory sickness. But also uh, on mental health, so uh, with depressions and uh, and less well-being, and also an impact on social health. So because of stigmatization and isolation, which hinders the people, so women, to have uh, a life with jobs, to study, etc. And of course, the topic of the socio, socio and culture, cultural um, dimension, which is very important because we see still our gender roles, which are very much embedded in our societies. Uh, for example, the care work. So, so we have mentioned it beforehand, even in Sweden, which is a very gender advanced country. So the, um, the, uh, the, the numbers 
of hours, the number of hours for care work um, done by women is still higher than men. I think it's a positive development, but we need more instrument to speed up here with the higher equality. And of course, uh, regarding social cultural dimensions, so we have um, we women do not have a say like men. Even our law does foresee that. So many countries have a quota for parliaments, for ministers, for example. But on average, there are about 75 to 70, uh, 25 to 27 percent of the uh, parliamentarians and ministers are female. It does not mean that women always engage for women, but it's so important to have more women in the, in the decision making bodies. And so, and here we see that there are many dimensions and putting, seeing the core here of the dimensions that women have um, uh, are very high um, affected by energy poverty due to this dimensions. And so we have to, we have to keep that in mind when de developing policy recommendations. And that's just to, um, uh, to yes, to repeat and to to strengths regarding the, um, the figures who is affected by poverty to have the risk of a higher poverty, it's sex, it's the age, for example, it's the household composition, so with or without children. So here we see a high exposure of women because there are many women-led single households high exposure to poverty, high exposure to energy poverty, and of course, the status, how or if you are employed, of course. And here we also we, we see the not stri uh, stringent um, biographies of women, for example. So that's also in terms of figures, the high risk of women um, to face energy poverty. And how is the policy situation? So here at the moment, so you have mentioned so the recommendations of the uh, committee of the regent, which is great. I think that's so important so to include it in concrete and binding policy and measures. But at the moment, so we don't see um, policies and measures which directly address the nexus of gender and energy poverty. I think so here we have to advance. So we have to see a good development, but that needs to be binding, that needs to be improved. And in the frame of empowerment of the project, one of our first activity was to check the financial support programs on energy poverty in our project countries, which are, for example, the Mediterranean countries, Spain, France, Italy, Croatia, Slovenia, Germany, and Albania, we included Germany, we included Sweden and Denmark. And we, we, we found a lot of financial support programs to support the people being in the situation of energy poverty, but not at all one program focusing or having a gender dimension, for example. And that's really very interesting because we know the situation. Of course, we still lack data, but the, um, so that is a very important recommendation. So to have targeted uh, support programs also, and for example, to gender budgeting, to know where the money is flowing, for example, that's a very, uh, that's very important. And um, coming up, um, keeping with the policy recommendations and the policy framework, so you have mentioned also the so European Green Deal, which is a great framework for our decarbonized societies, um, but it's, it's pretty gender blind. And I think that's also very important uh, and interesting because we have a super ambitious gender equality strategy of the European Commission. And we have our flagship for climate protection and for decarbonized societies, the European Green Deal, and we, we do not find gender dimension. And it would be so important, for example, for the topics of uh, renewable energy, which, where we see the higher vulnerability of women to energy poverty, where we see in many studies that the access and affordab affordability of technologies says that men are more benefiting than, than women. One example of Germany is, for example, the German government did a great program in the first corona year for electromobility, which is overall a good measure so to support uh, if you invest in, a, an electric vehicle, in an electric vehicle but we saw after two years that about 80 percent of the funding went to men and I think that's important to know so if the government is 
would like to have this objective so it's okay but so we assume that we need really a gender budgeting and to see where some money is flowing and because it would be also an opportunity to to fund e-bikes or to do or to um to uh put the focus on on mobility patterns where we know that the patterns are pretty different um so women from men the second for example is also the mob mobilizing the industry so it's so for example for coal phase out for uh, carbonized regions for example where we see big industrial uh, uh, plants are needing a lot of energy for example so there is we we put a lot of effort on coal miners what is super important but no recognition of reproductive work so what is about the reproductive work what is about with the families with all the services which may which are statistically mainly done by women in such regions. I think that's also very important and we can't find it in the European Green Deal. And of course, of energy efficiency. So it also refers to energy poverty. So the gendered, pat gendered patterns of house tenure and affordability of technologies, who is living in which building. So how is the building equipped, for example? That's one point. The second point in terms of workforce. The super male dominated construction and energy sector. So the, the energy efficiency sector is even more male than the renewable energy sector. And the a third dimension, for example, is the ownership situation. So, so the, the ownership of land, the ownership of buildings is in, in all European countries. So it's more, more uh, men are owning a real estate, etc. And so and so you have less decision making power here what you uh, what you want to do of course we have other topics of the european green deal but just to highlight that it's so important to check all the topics of the green deal and that we have a lot of gender dimensions we have to include here and a lot of them are also related to energy poverty so we did two studies, I can share the link later on, and regarding empowerment, so it was mentioned by Monica already, so it's um, an uh, horizon project uh, with the topic of um, energy poverty alleviation. The point what I would highlight here is that we have the cross-cutting issue of gender, of health, and of summer energy poverty. Because normally when you talk about energy poverty, all the people have the picture of, of cold winters and you are not able to heat your homes that maybe you have a wood stove, which is the case in, in a lot of regions of Europe where you also have, for example, have a lot of health impacts um, where you are dealing with candles, etc. But that's the main topic and that's unique of, uh, of empowerment. So to have this... Uh, this cross-cutting issue of uh, gender health and, um, and summer energy poverty. And what we are doing and uh, where Monica highlighted the collective assemblies, which is a very great measure to address the needs of the people, of the women, to provide safe spaces, to give women a say, to allow exchange and to have a collective learning because what we what we often see, and here I give you an example of Germany, we have we had a very um, nice energy saving and energy poverty program of Caritas, but only in Germany, in many European countries. But it was it was this the energy consulting, and it, you you never have um, a relationship on eye level. So you have the energy consultant, and you have um, the family, for example, or the women or the men, and that's unique of the collective assembly. So really to to, uh, to develop, to allow, to establish collective assemblies and thus to empower the women and the men and to feel that you, um, you gather knowledge, you gather expertise, you are able to act to do something against energy poverty. I think that's really uh, very interesting. And, uh, and what we also did is household energy visits, so to do a consultancy, but we considered, for example, to have mixed teams, women and men, and really so to have also material, so not to be to be a very much a teacher or professor, but really also to have a um, communication on eye level. We did also do-it-yourself workshops, so it's, for, for example, it was with balcony modules, with photovoltaics, so to empower people that you could, for example, use a balcony model in terms of 
technologies, but also in terms of information that you are you are allowed to do it because there is a lot of information around in the country. Oh, it's not allowed to use the balcony module just to provide some information and health workshops. So with uh, intermediators, so with uh, medical uh, experts, so to show the impact of energy poverty, mostly women, how is the health impact and what could be done. And very important so, um, is also the analysis and the design of the recommendations and so advocacy and policies are to, to show to the, uh, to the decision makers, how is the situation, what needs to be done. Here is a movie you, you could watch of Empower Meet. And here my finally last slide is to show you some gender tools, what we apply. I think that is also unique in the Empower Meet project that we apply gender tools that and I will focus on policy and advocacy and communication, but just mentioned the other ones as the gender analysis is how is the situation of gender and energy on national level? Because we have, well, in most of the countries, we have a very ambitious gender strategy with renewable energy goals, and we have a gender strategy, but we don't have a coherent strategy. So it's a bit the same like on European level, and that you have to think together and you have to include gender in the energy policy. For example, when a country is transposing the renewable energy directive with the energy communities. So you could, uh, one uh, indicator could be that there will be support also for at least 40% uh, or 50% should be, we should uh, we need equality uh, just to, to think about instruments to approach women, to inspire women to become a member, just to have the target. That, that is to analyze the situation. The second is the target, for example. A target would be to have a quota. Target is, for example, to what is also done with the collective assemblies to provide a safe space and to choose a time where women are available to think about it, to, to care for uh, baby, uh, um, baby care, for example, and also to have in mind the time poverty women are facing. So it's really so to, to support here that and to, just to know it. And what is also super important are gender trainings. That's very important um, because to provide the arguments to everybody, that's super important. And women's empowerment, um, of course, and then uh, two very important tools, for example, that's communication. So really to apply a gender inclusive language. So to have not, um, for example, to have no leaflets with um, male energy consultants, with white male energy consultants. So here we see a lot of, um, not gender inclusive language, that's very important, and not a non discriminative language. I mentioned the collective assemblies. It's very important so to show the visibility and representation of the women to have them as role models. So, here with the communication, we can do a lot. I think that's very important, and it's sometimes it's what we say it's. It's not easy, but it's an entry point because check some home pages, check the material what you have, and just and well, I always experience sometimes I have my stereotypes because it's my education, it's my life, and to be aware of that. I think that's so important. And what some in, in another project, for example, we introduced an awareness person. So just to to uh, confront the people when about discriminative uh, messages. Because sometimes you don't want to say it just to say, well, here we need really a strong engineer. So, so we have um, strong female and male engineers, not only male ones. I think that's very important. And of course, policy and advocacy. That's also so to have active policy recommendations uh, to include women in political decision making positions. To network, for example, with feminist associations, there is a lot of material, there's a lot of information, a lot of arguments around. So just use it. So it's, I think that's also very important. And for example, a pan European definition with gender and intersectional aspects. So I think that would be very important to have a very clear definition and to include gender. And here, my finally, and so what, what we developed as communication is like postcards. And we show it to the decision makers at conferences, at summits, at the energy week. And because the reality between people facing um, energy 
uh, poverty and the decision making. So it's a it's a big span. And to uh, to show what other sorts of the people. So it's heat or eat. I think that's really people have to ask. And uh, and so and also to to change the policy and just to mention here some uh, some recommendations. And here that's my really final. Um, slide is that we have a lot of uh, we need to change our structures and approaches so it's really that energy poverty goes beyond low income poor energy efficiency and high expenditure it's our our workforce our, how we organize our society how we rely on unpaid care work for example i think that is for us it's very clear and i think that's so we have to go beyond and therefore the drivers of energy they span across our current economic, social, employment, energy, climate, taxation, welfare, housing, health policy. So it's a big bunch that we have to think about to include the recommendations. And for example, that's one lessons learned of the Empower Me project is for as a housing policy, when you expand tourism, which is a positive issue and you have energy efficiency upgrades. So sometimes you increase structural injustice because it leads for the people, for the local people to unaffordable housing. It leads to gentrif uh, gentrification and to segregation, just to keep that in mind. Of course, to rethink our labor policies to have decent jobs. So how do we pay the care work? How, will, how do we pay our sectors? I think that's a very general point. We are aware of that. And I know it's, it's really general. And of course, to redirect our economic policies. So not only to, to stick to the GDP, but to, to, to stick to well-being. So it means so to reshape our taxation system. I'm not a tax uh, expert, but at least in Germany, the tax system is completely unjust for women. Um, to improve the access to public services. So it's, for example, to funding programs, to mobility, for example, to enact the right to energy and to include women. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Abbas Brunner, for this really complete presentation of challenges, solutions, uh, what empowerment is, is doing and why the, gen the Green Deal is still uh, to, to really, really gender blind and uh, what do we need to change for that. So we have a first question, we're moving on to, to questions already and exchanges. Uh, the first question from the chat is from Charlotte from DuneWorks and asking to you, Ms. Abbas Brunos, but also to other speakers if they also want to react just after. Uh, she's curious to hear all you, you, how you envision to have policy consider gender energy household tasks. What kind of measures or incentives can be developed around this? So if Ms. Abbas Brunos, you can answer to that and maybe someone else to react after that. Are you just muted? Yeah, super, super important question. Thank you very much. So um, to envision to have policy consider gendered energy household tasks. So I think it's really just to be aware about the power relations, for example, within the households. That's very important because we know on the one hand that women, and so I think one point is not to, we, we, we don't have to, we don't make to um, victim, victimize women as uh, in this energy poverty that's the first the second is so women are strong change uh, agents of change and so just to see how is a power relation in the household for example and um, i think it's it's policy uh, recommendations it's difficult but if we for example if we would have a different salary policy and we we uh, value more the care work for example if we know for example the value of the unpaid care work we know it's billions so i don't know i don't have the exact figure now but i think that that needs to be communicated it needs to be taken into account it, in corona times for example we talked we clapped so we we did a lot but we did not increase the salaries for the care sector for example and i think that is that would be a very first step to have um, a much higher value for the super important work mostly done by women another answer is maybe a bit unconcrete but maybe somebody else would like to to add something Thank you. And um, Mrs. Mrs. Guterres Blaya, do, do you wish to react on this question? Yes, I think it's, it, I mean, it's a very interesting question, very difficult to answer. Um, 
But I would say like we should give value to these essential uses of energy, not only in the household, but in society. So what, what uses of energy allows us to defend life, to have more dignified lives and, and, and stop precariousness, stop insecurity. So some of them are, are not uh, assumed by women, um, maybe a majority of them, but still like not only gendered energy tasks on the household, but also even if in a near future they are shared equally, like the essential uses of energy should be protected and should be uh, secured in a, in a different way with different policies, no? Because um, they are the uses that allows us to do other things in, in life, no? Without energy and water basic services, because in the Alliance Against Energy Poverty, we try to understand them as a whole, like basic supplies of water and energy. Um, we can't do many other uh, basic tasks on our days, no? Um, and and the, like the right to energy and the human right to water are key to other human rights like education, health, et cetera, no? So uh, even if these essential care tasks are no, uh, shared in an unequal way, um, this work and this care work is essential. So we should protect the energy uses around this with several um, measures. One can be the ban of these connections uh, and others can be a little bit more concrete, no? But I think we should protect the, the essential uses for energy that are not driven by profit. Thank you very much, Mrs. Guterres. Um, I was thinking maybe uh, Mrs. Tuto wants to give us her opinion or wants to jump in to describe more at the policy level what's, what step can be done towards uh, these goals. I don't know if you are with us. Maybe not. <laughs> so I will move on. I have another question for Mrs. Guterres and Davers Brunner. Um, so you have mentioned the various initiatives that can be done at the local level. And I find it very interesting what you said about the collective assemblies, uh, uh, this attempt to create a safety net for women as well to share their experiences regarding energy poverty. So I was wondering, uh, uh, you were talking about key local actors. So what are the local actors you engage with? And also, what is your relation with, for instance, the municipalities at the local level? So, in terms also of funds or of um, support. I'm happy to start, and maybe also Monica, you could add because Monica is the expert also of um, collective assemblies. I think for collective assemblies, of course, it's a local network. It's like neighborhood or social organization having good relationship and contact with the households. Of course, that's very important. And municipalities are great um, 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 authorities because municipalities they are. It depends, of course, but the city of Barcelona or the city of Munich, there are very big administrations, but you have also sub authorities and normally uh, municipalities is uh, the level closest to the citizens. So I think that is uh, very important um, um, to, to work with. Um, and uh, this is um, uh, this is actors. And your second question, sorry, I missed it. Um, sorry. It was what's the relation with the municipalities, so with the institutional local level mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of funds and support. Yeah, well, in, at least in Germany, I know that so it always depends. So you have front runners, and so you have, they, they implement great projects, they deal with the energy utility companies, they are aware, they are interested to, to get the data, for example. That's uh, very interesting, but it's, it's diverse. So I think there is a lot of positive experience with municipalities working on it. So I know in Germany, two municipalities, um, they developed with, um, a uh, utility company like a, a tariff or a system which is very transparent where you can see your um, your costs for example that is on the way but yeah but i would hand over to monica for example yeah this point 
Thank you so much. Um, yes, in terms of um, the relationship with municipal services or initiative, uh, we have to say like, mm, we, we cover different things like the collective assemblies on energy poverty, we have bi-weekly cover different profiles than what the offices of energy poverty of Barcelona are covering. Uh, in our assemblies, we normally have cases and situations that are sometimes at the margins of the society um, or that have tried to get a, um, an appointment on these offices and maybe they, they don't, I mean, they don't answer the phone sometimes, they, they don't uh, attend in person anymore, you, everything is online. Uh, so of course, like sometimes very good tools that the, the public sphere can bring have also uh, some, some gaps, no? And, and as civil society, we, we try to sustain that. This doesn't mean that we are not asking, for example, these um, energy uh, poverty points to return to the in-person appointments because we think this is very important. But it is true that these offices in Barcelona are doing a very important work, you know, as something like a one-stop shop. Um, but um, in the past, it also was a policy that we um, try to improve in, in, in terms of that they used to be energy poverty offices. And we said, let's not name them like this because it has a like a stigma into it. And what I, what I just put on, on the chat, like we can't point at people who is having high consumes, consumptions because they have just more needs and more precariousness, no? So let's bring everybody in the society into these offices, those who are in energy poverty and those, and those who are not, because maybe those who are not in energy poverty have more options and more, uh, uh, I don't know, more tools to um, decrease their consumption or to pay for uh, better uh, supplies. But let's not bring only uh, the poor to these offices. Let's not only point at the energy poor to be careful with their consumption because this is very unfair, no? So if we want a just transition, uh, we need to include this. And I think what we have done with municipalities, uh, not only Barcelona, but many others is trying to include this perspective that is more empowering. And that is also trying to confront the actors that have bigger power in this equation, which are transnational utility companies um, that are making lots of profit with something that is essential for life. So we need to uh, bring this to the, to the picture uh, and not only bring like um, uh, perspectives, I don't know the name in English, but paternalistas. No, we, we need to treat equally those who are in energy poverty and those who are not, because maybe now we can ask more from those who can afford energy. So yeah, let's continue with the, with the good work with the advocacy and municipalities are a, a good point where to start. Thank you very much for your answers. And yes, for sure, the, the perspective of local and regional governments, as we were mentioning also before with Mrs. Tuto, uh, it's, they are crucial. So thank you for, for your contributions. And um, staying on the local and regional government's perspective, I want to go back to Jamie and uh, to the charter that she has mentioned before. So. Uh, we have seen that the energy poverty perspective is not yet on the charter, which is going through our revision process. But we, uh, aside from the fact that some, uh, some, there are some specific examples of municipalities that have put in place some action plans, which parts that specifically address energy poverty, if I'm not wrong, as in Spain, you mentioned before. So uh, I was wondering what other aspects are there in the charter that are addressed and that we have seen being root causes and of energy poverty. 
Yeah. Um, so, yes, indeed, through the 31 articles of our charter, they address nine main areas where local and government, regional governments have a competence and power to effectively promote gender equality uh, and create societal conditions where boys, girls, men and women in all their diversity can thrive and, and pursue their ambitions on equal footing. So to tackle the underlying causes, I mentioned really briefly earlier, there's the education aspect. So not only uh, for young children, challenging gender stereotypes, um, but also about climate and, and energy. I think that's something that needs to be also brought into the schools, awareness raising. Uh, the charter also foresees uh, a lot of provisions around uh, public services and what the local, local and regional governments can do, including care infrastructure to lighten the burden on women and in the um, unpaid reproductive uh, roles that they find themselves in. And so I do also want to highlight related to care infrastructure, this year, the European Union uh, in the third quarter is expected to release a communication on a European care strategy. And that includes a revision of the Barcelona targets, which are uh, the targets for how many spaces should be available for children in uh, accessible, affordable, high quality care. So that's all part of the bigger picture of the, the frame and the background, which makes it possible for women to um, yes, to participate in things like the collective assemblies, to be in the decision-making spaces, whether that's in an associative, uh, political, or entrepreneurial or industrial sense. Um, also, as in employment, uh, to tackle pay gaps and um, precarity, I think something like in public authorities, it's something like 60, 60 or 70 percent of the employees are women in public services uh, at the local level in Europe. And so the charter has um, articles that call for fair pay, recruitment and promotion processes, uh, also chapters dedicated to gender balanced leadership and decision making influence. Uh, but there is also a call for citizen consultations and for going directly, not waiting for people who are maybe marginalized in the community to come to you at the municipal administration uh, to speak about their concerns and challenges, but to go to them and create that space, just as uh, the collective assemblies have and some of what you've illustrated, Ms. havers Bonner, in your presentation for Empower Med. So I would say there's a lot of complementarity. Uh, also the focus, yes, on solidarity, and I really appreciated what uh, Monica said about changing the narrative a little bit. We see this in in the in the work we do also on migrant integration. Uh, here at CMR, we like to pursue. We're aiming for a narrative that is positive and empowering, and looking to highlight the contributions uh, that each person in the community can make and see their value, what they bring to the to the pie, I don't know if you could say, which ingredients they bring instead of seeing um, people who are maybe a bit more vulnerable or disadvantaged as purely risks or burdens, but to really focus more on uh, what is the added value that they bring to the community. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Charlotte, but uh, Monica already answered in, in the chat. Um, on disaggregated data, you can get them from that one-stop shops from municipalities and put in place from municipalities and, and governments uh, on how, who is being disconnected, who is receiving social tariffs or social benefit discounts. Uh, so thank you for, for your inputs, Monica. If there are no other questions, even if we are a bit in advance, and I, I, I just um, uh, need to say that uh, Katatuto had to leave us earlier. She, she, she apologized. Um, so if there are no other questions, maybe we can we can conclude in a, in a few minutes, but maybe to give everyone a last word on, on this question, uh, I will start uh, with you, Mrs. Abbas Brunner, if you have like 30 seconds to, to conclude, uh, please, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so thank you very much and thanks for the questions. And I think so um, what I like is really the, the, the awareness of gender. I think that's very positive in the energy sector and the energy positive sector. But what we, what we still miss is gender mainstreaming. So really so to, to have it in all the sectors, to have a broad approach, to make, for example, when I plan a project, I check the costs, I check the feasibility, I check the plan, and I have to check gender. And not at the very end of the project, just to do one gender webinar, but from, from the very beginning. And I think that is very important. We are on a good way, but we need the policy from top down to, um, to implement and to use the tools what we have. Thank you very much. And just and uh, because we talk about energy poverty, so at the moment we are at the edge of a fossil centralized energy system and we go to a decentralized renewable energy system. And I think it's a super opportunity that uh, to use it to include more women, to have more democracy, to have the right to energy. I think that's, um, I don't say window of opportunity, but I think it's it can be a good point. And, unfortunately forced by a war, for example, I think there are so many external factors we, to see it positive, if, if it's possible, just to use it and for, to go for a democratic and fair energy system. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, for, you, for your last uh, for conclusion, conclusion words, concluding remark. Yes. Well, that, uh, that we can do it. I guess there's no excuse anymore to say uh, that it, that the two topics are not connected or that local and regional governments don't have the margin uh, of maneuver to, to, to create positive change. So I'd like to really follow this up. There's a lot of links. Thank you so much to the other speakers for sharing. Uh, I'll definitely be reading those with a lot of interest and in taking inspiration from that in the update of our charter this year. So uh, if you agree, I'd be happy also to share with you uh, some of the drafting of the new texts as your your true experts in the field. Thank you, Jamie and uh, Monica Guterres Blaya, please for your for your concluded remarks. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to share that I think uh, no, we had this uh, goal of women taking action against energy poverty is to say that women are already doing so and it is the moment also for, for public policies to take action in favor of women and in favor of vulnerability in general, which is very related to intersectionality of different axes of inequality and oppression. And I also very much agree with what Katharina said, we are in, in the middle of a very complicated path and if we fail to deliver sustainable energy for everybody we are also putting this weight into our colleagues that are women in the global south protecting um, the territories and uh, the environmental um, and ecosystems no so let's do it for like for all the women globally and to have less vulnerability in the world we live in Thank you very much. Uh, just before I conclude, uh, I would like just to say that the Covenant of Myers is a bottom-up movement, and as such, it is stronger with your involvement and your input. So uh, we ask you to, to fill a, a quick feedback survey in which you can share your feedback on this session, as well as your suggestions on, for future events. So will, the link will be in the chat, so it takes just a few seconds. So thank you for all the speakers. And again, uh, Mrs. Katatuto apologize for, for, for leaving earlier. Uh, thank you for all the speakers for, for your really relevant inputs. Fighting against energy poverty is more than ever a priority if we really want an energy transition that leaves no one behind. And as we understood today, this fight it cannot be gender blind. So the, the gender perspective needs to be taken into account at all levels of decisions and actions involving all stakeholders. There are already some good examples uh, on how actions can be deployed at the local levels. And we saw today with the empowerment projects, really concrete example, collective assemblies, visits in households, how we can do to alleviate uh, energy poverty with a gender perspective. But it has to be generalized. And this is why sharing such good practices is so relevant. Therefore, 
please share this webinar around you. It will shortly be available on the Covenants website and on YouTube. But also please visit, and it's more important, the website of the Empowerment Projects with all the relevant information, documents, toolboxes uh, made by the, the partners, the nine partners of the, of the projects. And uh, remind, uh, I would like to also remind you to join the Cities Energy Saving Sprint that you can find on the Covenant of Myers. So with these last words, uh, I would like to thank you again for joining us today at this really interesting webinar and needed uh, subject, a really important theme. And we wish you from the Covenant of Myers Europe office a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Theo, just to remind, thank you. I've just posted in the chat the oh. link to evaluate the webinar. Okay, so click just... on the link before leaving the webinar. <laughs> we can send it in the thank you email as well, yeah. but just to um, find out how we can improve and how you how you found the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a nice thank afternoon. You. Bye.